Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Michael Byers. I'm the co-director of the Outer Space Institute, along with Aaron Bowley. Um, the Outer Space Institute is a global network of experts committed to solving challenges in near-Earth space. Um, we focus on transdisciplinarity, on cutting-edge research, and on progressive policy change. Aaron and I are also professors at UBC. And Aaron is in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. I am in the Department of Political Science. Um, I've learned a lot of physics because of my collaboration with Aaron, and he's learned quite a bit of political science and international law. We, um, we were inspired to create the Outer Space Institute in part by a remarkable man named John McDonald. Um, John was a professor at UBC 54 years ago when together with Vern Detweiler, he created McDonald, Detweiler and Associates, which today is MDA and Canada's largest space company. Because of John McDonald, there is a Canada arm on the International Space Station, built by MDA. Because of John McDonald, we have Radarsat satellites, like Radarsat 2 and Radarsat Constellation, producing very high quality imagery at night through clouds from space. And because of John's inspiration to us, after his passing, we went to MDA and said we'd like to have an annual lecture in his honor. And that's what this is about. So thank you, MDA, for sponsoring this lecture series. This is the second of the John S. McDonald Outer Space Lectures. There will be another one in 2024. Um, and uh, Alfredette, John's wife, is with us here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we have a very special guest this evening, and you'll learn more about her shortly. My job is to introduce our moderator, who is also very special. Tanya Harrison is a fellow of the Outer Space Institute. She is a planetary scientist with a PhD from Western University in London, Ontario. Um, she went on to work at NASA on a couple of Mars rovers programs when she was very young moved on from that to become director of research of the Arizona State University's New Space Initiative. And then from there to Planet, which is one of the world's most important Earth imaging companies, where she was director of science. And earlier this year, um, she left Planet to move back to Canada to do some really exciting things that you'll learn about in the future and I can't tell you about tonight. <laughs> um, but she's an extraordinary human being. She's a, a role model uh, for several important uh, diversity groups. Um, she's uh, a major media personality, um, not just in Canada, but around the world. And I can't imagine a better person uh, to introduce our lecturer. So um, Tanya and Jan, if you could both come forward. The other thing I will say, very briefly, is that we don't let people give speeches at the Outer Space Institute. This is a moderated discussion, and it will open up to questions from the floor fairly soon. Aaron will be in this front area with a microphone. I will be in the back area with a microphone, and you will ask questions and we will have an interactive session. So prepare your questions now. So without any further ado, Tanya, we are in your hands. Thank you. So much, Michael.
thank you for that amazing introduction. <laughs> um, but I'm here for somebody else to steal the show. So um, I'd like to introduce our main speaker tonight, Jan Chodas, uh, who has had a 40-year career with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory before retiring as the Director of Planetary Science in July of this year. Born and raised in Canada, she has managed numerous space, si space science missions, including Juno, which remains in orbit of Jupiter, and Europa Clipper, which is a mission set to go to the Jovian moon of Europa in 2024. Um, I'll cut the bio off there so that we can focus on, you know, sort of the Q&A section of uh, the stuff that you're working on. So just kind of by a show of hands, how many people here are not familiar with JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory? Okay, a few people. So could you tell us a little bit about what JPL is and how it got started? Sure. Thanks for having me and uh, hosting um, John's wife. Hello. Um, JPL uh, started in the uh, 30s. There was um, a professor, Theodore von Karman, who was a Caltech professor. And in the 30s, he and some of his students started uh, experimenting with uh, rockets and rocket propulsion. So the, the Caltech campus um, wasn't too happy, and neither was the city of Pasadena, for them uh, launching these rockets in the middle of the, the town. So they went up to um, a dry riverbed, um, the Arroyo, near the San Gabriel Mountains to do their experiments. Um, so that was in like 1936, I think, when they first launched rockets from that site. In 1939, they started exploring um, jet-assisted takeoff for propeller planes so that propeller planes could uh, take off and land on, on shorter runways. And there was a lot of interest in that because of the war, obviously. Um, and then around 1943, they submitted a proposal to the Army to start um, investigating how to launch missiles. And in that proposal is where they first used the term jet propulsion laboratory. So you can see how the, the jet propulsion ties back to the jet assisted takeoff. We do not do <laughs> jet assisted takeoff <laughs> or jet propulsion uh, at all anymore. Uh, we've really uh, moved far away from that, but that's how it originally started. So if you're not doing any jet propulsion now, what kind of stuff is JPL focusing on? So our mission is to explore uh, the solar system and beyond for uh, NASA and the American taxpayers and, and the world. And it's really an inspiring um, place to work at because I, I really feel like we're on the, the forefront of space exploration. We have uh, many planetary missions, and I'm sure we'll talk about uh, some of those later. We also do Earth orbiting missions. Um, tracking um, Earth's gravity, uh, ocean topography, um, that sort of thing, as well as uh, astrophysics missions, things like um, looking for asteroids. So those are our main missions, planetary, Earth, and astrophysics. But then we also have a very strong uh, technology program that supports that, a, a premier um, host of scientists who work with the engineers and technologists to uh, define the science questions and then decide with the mission designers how to um, put missions together to solve those questions. And can you tell us a little bit about your own pathway into JPL and kind of how you ended up there in the first place and made your way up to the ranks to be the director of planetary science? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're just in, a small in, question yeah, there. In, in three <laughs> easy sentences. Um, so I did my um, bachelor's of uh, applied science at University of Toronto in the engineering science program. And that program uh, has two years of general engineering, and then um, you could choose a, a special option to focus on. And so in my third and fourth years, I focused on aerospace engineering. Um, I found that I really liked the beauty of the precision of physics and math and and space. I was not a fan of the aeronautical linear or nonlinear differential equations, fluid mechanics. That's not my thing. So uh, I focused on the space uh, side of that. And then as part of that program, they emphasized, um, they encouraged us to do a fifth year master's program to focus on a specialty. And I focused on dynamics and control of spacecraft at the University of Toronto Institute for Aerospace Studies. So that's where the, the grad school for the aerospace department. Um, at that 
school, when I was there in the late 70s, there were about 60 grad students, and there were um, two women, one married, and me. <laughs> so I was like, OK, I like these odds. Uh, and in fact, I met my future husband there. <laughs> um, I was starting my master's degree when he was starting his PhD, and we were in the same group with um, Dr. Peter Hughes, who specializes in dynamics and control of spacecraft. And um, my husband, Paul, was a real um, space nerd from day one. And so uh, when I finished my master's and um, I decided I was not going to do a PhD, uh, he said, oh, well, and I had worked at Spar Aerospace, now part of MDA, for two summers. Uh, he, and I, so I thought, oh, I'll go work on Canadarm1 <laughs> and, uh, or Radarsat1. Um, and he said, oh, you have to apply to JPL. And I'm like, why would they accept a, a Canadian citizen? You know, I like that you thought big. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, so I applied, and in late 79, there was a shortage, apparently, of aerospace engineers uh, in the wow. States, and so I got a job offer from JPL. JPL is, part, is a division of Caltech, the California Institute for Techno of Technology, and so uh, being a university employee, they were able to sponsor me for a J-1 visa, which was good for a year and then renewable twice. So I thought I was going down to California for three years. So um, I arranged to uh, travel down in late January to start my job. And um, Christmas rolled around, and like there's no proposal. And New Year's Eve rolled around, no proposal. So I'm like, OK, I'm leaving in two weeks. <laughs> it's now or never. <laughs> so um, he proposed, and the rest is history. <laughs> But it was a smart move on his part, because after um, two years on my J-1 visa, JPL sponsored me for a green card. And um, by that time, we were married. And so um, I became uh, a green card holder based on my job. And he got it as a spouse. And so there you go. Thanks. <laughs> so that's how I ended up there. And then you wanted me to describe my career briefly? Yeah, we can talk about it kind of in, in general terms, or if you want to move specifically into like the missions you worked on and how that played into your kind of ascent through the ranks at JPL. Sure. So I was really um, privileged to work on the Galileo mission to Jupiter starting in 1980. And I worked in the um, attitude control subsystem, designing control algorithms for the scan platform control that contains some of the pointing instruments for Galileo. Um, I, I ended up working on Galileo for 10 years, actually. Um, when I was first hired, the spacecraft was supposed to launch in 1982, and then it was pushed to 84, and then 85, and then 86. Um, there were lots of money problems and political problems that, as a new employee, I was pretty oblivious to uh, at the time. And so um, I kept plugging away, and I, I it took on different roles within the subsystem. and. Um, in 86, I was leading the attitude control team for mission operations. So we were getting ready to launch the spacecraft and, and fly the mission. And then the terrible tragedy of Challenger happened in January 1986. And um, Galileo was going to be the next shuttle launch in May of 86. That didn't happen. We brought the spacecraft back to um, JPL. I became the uh, manager leading some of the hardware and software changes that we made because the, the, the mission design changed and the spacecraft uh, needed to make some changes. And so that's really when I got into technical management. Uh, and then um, we got through that dark period and uh, Galileo ended up launching in 89. And I worked on that for six months um, through the Venus flyby and then uh, moved on. So that was my Galileo experience. And then I um, worked on the Cassini mission to Saturn um, as the technical manager of the attitude control subsystem. So again, it was a familiar subsystem, um, taking on uh, more responsibility, uh, leading that through um, its trials and tribulations, ended up with a successful launch in 97, flying to Saturn and having a, an amazing mission. Uh, and then I, I did some early pre-project work and then uh, went into the um, Mars Exploration Rover team. And I worked with 
the uh, flight software team uh, managing the flight software that was uh, running on Spirit and Opportunity. And so I um, worked on that um, and, and stayed on that mission through operations, through the first prime mission, which was only supposed to be 90 sols long. Of course, Spirit and Opportunity lasted. I think Opportunity was 10 years long. Um, it was almost 15 by the time um, we lost contact. OK, OK. <laughs> so uh, we really over over engineered <laughs> the rovers, apparently. Um, but that's one of JPL's trademarks, is that we look to build margin into our designs and um, reliability and the ability to tolerate uncertainty in the environments that we're going to encounter so that we have margin and, and we can be assured that um, we won't uh, have a hiccup at the first um, transgression into uh, a part of the environmental uh, require, environment that we weren't anticipating. We, we try to anticipate all of that stuff. So I worked on that. And then I became, and then I did some, um, JPL is a matrix organization, so I managed uh, the systems and software division, the line organization that um, managed the people who worked on the missions. And then I um, became the Juno project manager when it was entering the development phase of the life cycle. Um, so I was um, really happy to take on that role as the project manager in the sense that I was um, back at Jupiter, so I had already spent you know, 10 years on Galileo at Jupiter, and so I understood the environment. Um, I, uh, I had the experience of working with project management teams, and so I was able to um, bring that to bear when I was the project manager myself. I had always worked on what we call in-house missions, where JPL is doing the design and build and test of the spacecraft, but Juno was a partnership with, or a contract with Lockheed Martin for the spacecraft bus, so it was a great broadening experience for me to understand how to work with a spacecraft contractor and the different cultures there and how to make those succeed together. Um, and Juno launched successfully in August 2011 and is arrived at the planet in 2016 and is, is still chugging away, I think 54 orbits or so, so far, doing uh, really well. So that's been very rewarding. Um, and then I, I ran the um, Office of Safety and Mission Success, which is a line organization that uh, sets the requirements for reliability and quality and environments and parts and, um, for example, uh, the radiation. They they would underst they understood the radiation environment at Jupiter, and so uh, we would uh, work with them to understand how to design the hardware to to meet um, the the expected environment plus the margin. Uh, and then I moved over to run the um, Engineering and Science Directorate, and that directorate was about 4,500 people of the 6,500 uh, JPLers. That organization contains the engineers, the scientists, and the technologists who work together to, um, we look to the scientists to define the questions that they want answered, and then we, we work with them to figure out um, what instruments to use to answer those questions, to get the data to answer those questions, and then the mission designers um, come up with uh, missions, mission concepts that will answer those questions, and then uh, we, we go to NASA through various mechanisms to get funding approved to start working on the mission. So the, the engineering and science directorate, oh, and then I can't, I can't forget the technologists. Those are key people who look ahead 10 years even to understand what technologies might be needed to explore Europa or Enceladus. Um, and so um, they're part of the early equation as well when putting together these mission concepts. And, and then um, that organization I, I ran for a few years. And then I became the Europa Clipper project manager. Um, Third time to Jupiter, <laughs> so I was like, "Oh, this is awesome!" Um, and so I, um, again, again, uh, I, I joined the project uh, at the start of the development phase. So I was back doing the phase of the life cycle that I enjoy the most, um, and also um, the the uh, planet Jupiter, which I um, had experience with in terms of its idiosyncrasies and things you needed to worry about. Um, I also, as a flagship mission, had to work much more closely with NASA headquarters than I had even with the Juno 
project manager responsibility. And so that was a, a good opportunity for me personally to understand how to how to work with NASA headquarters in a way that it was a win-win for both sides, that we would get the funding that we needed in a way that was, um, was they could trust us to keep that commitment and deliver um, on the project. And then about a year and a half ago, um, the director for planetary science at JPL uh, left JPL to take on another position, and so I became the director for planetary science, which includes um, the Psyche mission to the metal asteroid Psyche, which is launching in October, the Europa Clipper mission, um, which is launching a year from this October. Um, all of the Mars missions are in the directorate. Uh, we have some lunar missions that are underway, that are in development still, that will be launching in 25, 24 and 25 as well as technology developments, um, scientists to understand the science strategies and, and questions, um, and as well as operating missions. Juno is in the, the, the directorate. Um, let's see, Mars, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, um, Curiosity, Perseverance, uh, and, and the Ingenuity Helicopter, all of that is in the directorate. So you basically then I retired. everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, so did you, was Jupiter something that you were particularly interested in and you were excited that you keep, kept getting to go back to it? Or was there anything that you wished you had a chance to work on at JPL that you didn't really get a chance to touch while you were there? I, I would say that Working on my first mission, Galileo, was um, to an outer planet. And then my second one, Cassini, was to an outer planet. And there's a certain character of that development where you have to, you have to tolerate delayed gratification because <laughs> it takes years to, to fly a spacecraft to Jupiter or Saturn. And so there's a different mentality. It's not... It's not that you're going to launch an Earth orbiter and have immediate gratification of getting the data back and seeing how things work. So, it, so there's that, but there's also a need for greater resiliency in the autonomy and the fault protection that we build into the um, software and hardware. Because it's so far away, we only contact our spacecraft when they're traveling to an outer planet. We only contact them once a week say, or once every couple of weeks. So they're operating on their own. And if something goes wrong with the hardware or the software hiccups, the spacecraft has to know how to take care of it itself. And so that, we call it that fault protection design, um, has to be quite robust and requires a lot of testing. And, and spacecraft that are, are low risk because they're very expensive, Europa Clipper is a $5 billion mission has a lot of um, redundancy. And so in fault protection land, that means that you have to be able to swap from sun sensor A to sun sensor B, for example, or reset a sun sensor, or, or turn them off and use the star trackers. I mean, there's a lot of intricacies. So, there's, so I had grown up through that as well. So there's certain characteristics, I think, about outer planet missions that I liked. And also, the Earth orbiter missions are... Um, at this point in time, there are commercial companies who build spacecraft buses for commercial uses. So JPL just partners uh, or contracts with them for the spacecraft bus. That's all out of house. And there's not, there's really just the instrument side that's done at the lab and the mission design and that sort of thing. And I liked the, for, but, but for the outer planet missions, we are much more involved, even with Juno using the Lockheed Martin spacecraft bus, they'd never flown anywhere other than, any farther out than Mars. And so they had a lot to learn that we worked with them to understand the additional fall protection, the environmental concerns, that sort of thing. And so there was more involvement. So I think that sort of aspects appealed to me rather than the um, observatory type or the Earth orbiting type. That makes sense. It's like a new challenge. And I think I, to give some people perspective, if you, know, you say it takes a really long time to get to the outer planets, when you're launching something into Earth orbit, it's maybe a few days before you start getting data back. If you're going to the moon, maybe days to weeks, maybe a year if it takes a while to get into your happy orbit. Mars is like six to eight months, so a little bit of a delay. But then from Mars to Jupiter, the next planet out, you're talking five, six years to get there with your spacecraft. 
And so some people working on these missions, like the scientists working on Cassini, that's probably the only data that they're ever going to get from that planner for their entire career. And that's mind blowing on its own. But also the fact that JPL can build spacecraft that nobody can touch to try to repair for mm. that long. <laughs> so it's taken you years to get there and then it still works for years and years after that is absolutely incredible. There's probably no piece of technology that we interact with in our day-to-day -day lives here on Earth where you could just <laughs> let it go and never have to fix yeah. it. Like your car is not gonna work for as long as Juno has without getting at least an oil change. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really amazing to see the kind of things that JPL can do. Good point. So we know you mentioned Psyche and Europa Clipper coming up. Mm -hmm. What else is on kind of the, the near term horizon for JPL? And what do you want to see for JPL in like the extreme future down the line? So um, Psyche this year, Europa Clipper in a year. And then we do have Lunar Trailblazer, which is a small sat um, going to launch um, in the spring of next year to orbit the moon and look for water volatiles. And so that's part of JP, uh, JPL getting back, essentially back into the lunar program because JPL did a lot of that lunar um, precursor and in robotic investigations before the Apollo missions. Um, we also have a, um, relative to lunar, we have a, a, an experiment called the Far Side Seismic Suite, which is the, um, the remaining seismometer of the suite that flew on the InSight mission to Mars, they had a spare, and that one we were putting into a package to fly on a lander to land on the far side of the moon and um, have a seismometer in place to, as a start of a lunar geophysical network of seismometers. And so we think that that's a, a way of piggybacking, a cheap man's way to, <laughs> to get seismometers placed on Mars flying on these, um, these landers that are, are part of the, the new uh, CLIPS program that NASA's running. Um, we also have some, we have three uh, very small rovers that are being designed to um, work in um, coordination with each other. There's, there's a base station and two rovers carrying um, penetrating radars that will, will be launched to the moon again, and then they will be um, roving around, proving out coordinated um, communication amongst the three of them, all autonomously to um, meet certain goals. So that's more of a technology demonstration, but again, it's a, it's a rover, small scale, I mean, physically small compared to the, the big ones that we've been doing lately, um, but also a technology demonstration for um, advancing autonomy. The, the, the big one on the plate is Mars sample return. And um, you may know that Perseverance has been uh, collecting samples on Mars, putting the, the samples into tubes and um, dropping, the it, Perseverance rover has dropped about, I think it's 12 tubes on the, on the surface of Mars as a um, contingency depot in case the, the rover um, gets stuck somewhere or freezes. There are 12 sample tubes lying on the surface of Mars today for a mission to come to go to Mars and pick up and bring back. But in addition, um, the rover is continuing to collect samples um, as it goes up on the, the delta uh, of Jezero Crater, and, and they'll continue to collect samples and, and maybe get an even better suite of samples to, to bring back but how do you bring them back? And so um, we have a NASA partnership with ESA, the European Space Agency. Um, that it, so it's an international partnership, very complex technologically, very difficult engineering-wise um, to launch. Uh, JPL is doing the sample retrieval lander, which is um, a, space, a, a, space, a lander that will fly to Mars land on the surface, and it will, um, theoretically, Perseverance will still be trotting around the surface, and Perseverance will come up and, and um, hand over its uh, samples to this lander that will go, be put into what's, what's essentially um, a six or seven foot tall, two meter tall uh, rocket that the lander will carry. It's called the MAV, the Mars Ascent Vehicle, and that vehicle will be tossed up off the surface of the, uh, off the, the platform on the lander, ignite, and then lift off into orbit around Mars with the, um, the orbiting 
uh, canister containing the samples, and then it will shoot that canister out into orbit around Mars. Meanwhile, the, the European Space Agency is building the Earth, retrieve, Earth Return Orbiter to launch from the Earth to go into orbit around Mars with a capture and containment system that will capture this orbiting sample, trap it, put it in a capsule, and then fly back to the Earth and um, drop the capsule onto the um, Utah um, proving grounds um, for retrieval by humans. So that is all <laughs> uh, um, autonomous, um, very difficult um, mechanically. Um, reliability is, is obviously difficult when you have all of these um, mechanisms that you need to use and, and ways to, um, again, think through what could go wrong. You know, we're constantly thinking, what could go wrong? <laughs> so that carries over into everyday life. You know, what could go wrong? I need to allow some margin um, before you know, getting to the airport. But what can go wrong with my mission? And how do I solve that? How do I anticipate and put something in place now to prevent that from being a mission-ending problem? And so that Mars sample return is um, just going to be an incredibly um, amazing, but extremely difficult uh, on both sides of the ocean. And, and in, in, in addition, you have um, culture differences, you have language differences, you have time zone differences. Um, so it's, uh, it's a big one. There's some really great animations online if you want to look up what this oh. sequence looks like. It's basically what they planned in the Martian for Mark Watney if it hadn't gone wrong, but with little samples instead of a human. Um, so take a look at that. But I'm sure it'll be fine for JPL. You know, you guys are really good at building things that have you know, really complex sequences of events where there is no margin for error for all those things to happen exactly the way they should. And I mean, I got to admit, back in the Curiosity days when they were describing the sky crane to us on the science team, we were like, there is no way that is going to work. We were, we were like, okay, you know, August 7th, we're going to be looking for new jobs. <laughs> and then it worked flawlessly. It's yeah. like, okay, we, you can't second guess JPL. Well, we work hard to um, have, that, have, have that come through every time. It's, it's, it's really rewarding. The, the brain power of the community there is just amazing. And, and working in that culture, everyone is working towards a common goal. Teamwork is critically important. Communication is critically important. Um, making sure that you own your responsibilities, but you also look beyond the boundaries of your responsibilities to make sure that what you're doing meshes properly with the work that others are doing so that the, the whole hangs together. So looking at the big picture, understanding that. Um, it's just really we have many idiosyncratic people at JPL, and um, they're all brilliant. And it's just really stimulating and rewarding and, and really hard to do. Well, it's such an amazing environment because you, you have a lot of people that have self-selected to be there, or pretty much everyone has. Nobody applies for a job at JPL casually, as opposed to <laughs> you might have somebody that just needs a job, and they end up at a place like a Lockheed Martin mm. or a Honeywell. And it, it's not the same, whereas everyone at JPL is so passionate about what they do mm -hmm. and like they want to explore the solar system. They want to build the best rover or the best satellite. And that's a really unique thing that you can't really find anywhere else. I think that's, I've never worked in a commercial company other than my two summers at Spyro Space, <laughs> but I think that um, that's part of the beauty of being, of belonging to a university, but we're not, doing just the research, we're, we also have these mission goals to achieve. And yet we're not competing with each other for sales numbers or number of clients or you know, investment dollars. It's everyone's on the same team trying to, we have heated discussions. In fact, one of the JPL traits that um, an outsider comes in and, and they, they'll come into a meeting and they'll, they'll listen and people will be attacking, you know, have you thought of this? What if this happens? That's not going to work. You know, it's that type of conversation. And they don't understand the, that the, it's, we're not attacking the people or the person. We're, we're working together to attack the design to make it more robust. It, it sounds 
odd, though, to an outsider who comes in to, the, to that type of discussion. But that's, that's, the, that's the dynamic that, that goes on all the time. I think it's about time for us to turn over to the audience to see if anybody has questions about anything related to JPL, about Jan's career, space in general. Okay. Unmute them. So we're running mics in the front here, as well as in the back, so please don't be shy. Raise your hands if you have your own, here we go. I'm Gunhild hogensen Jörv, and I'm not a professor in space, <laughs> but uh, I'm with Michael. I'm a political scientist and a professor in security studies. And so what I'm interested in was a user touched on international cooperation, and you mentioned the European Space Agency. Uh, I'm curious, because space research has been highly dependent, as I understand it, on international cooperation, to what degree or in what ways has the cooperation been affected by all the mess that we're doing here on Earth? For example, uh, the relationship with Russia, where there was cooperation previously, uh, has this tumultuous events on, on Earth affected very much what is happening on your research or, or your projects, or do you find international cooperation still functions quite well? I would say that um, the cooperation that we have with um, CNES, for example, we do um, Earth orbiting missions looking for uh, studying the oceans um, and the lakes and rivers. That has been going on for more than a decade, and that works well. Um, we work with ESA well. We work um, with uh, the Italian Space Agency. We On Juno, there was an instrument that was um, provided by the Italian Space Agency, an infrared spectrometer that is flying on the Juno mission. And so, and that, that relationship um, worked, worked well then. And, and we have a, a mission to v uh, Venus. We have a mission to Venus, <laughs> or actually two that we're working on that I forgot to mention that planet. Um, and um, they have um, contributions from the German Space Agency and from the Italian Space Agency, and I think also from CNES. So all of that. All of those relationships are still working well. I would say that um, the Rosalind Franklin rover that ESA built that was supposed to be launched um, in 2020 by a Russian rocket and had some components that were provided by the Russians, um, that fell apart um, with the invasion um, of Ukraine. And so um, ESA is now trying to refactor that mission and remove the Russian portions and have NASA backfill those holes. So that's very difficult because the rover was, all, was fully assembled and ready for launch. And so it's difficult to kind of retrofit pieces and find a launch vehicle, et cetera. But that is part of the challenge that NASA took on after working with ESA um, after the, the Russian invasion. In the back. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is uh, David Kendall. I was the uh, Director General of Space Science at uh, the Canadian Space Agency for many, many years and very much involved in a project that you didn't mention and that Canada was involved in, which is the Phoenix mission, which mm. came out of JPL. Uh, so Canada does work closely with uh, JPL. Um, I have many colleagues down there and uh, uh, we've worked uh, on other missions, which are more uh, remote sensing missions and other, uh, other projects. Um, my question, though, uh, is uh, you gloss over a little bit, I think, Jan, the, uh, the politics that goes into selecting a mission and the lobbying and the difficulties that uh, you, you and the uh, laboratory have to deal with uh, with the political system in the US and getting a mission um, approved mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, and successfully uh, finished. Uh, could you give us a little bit more insight into some of that? Because I think uh, that's, uh, that's very germane to uh, this, this particular discussion. So I, as, a, as a JPL employee, I don't have a lot of insight into the, um, the NASA conversations that take place 
within NASA headquarters or um, between NASA and um, OMB. But I do agree that um, we would like the, the, the scientists, the planetary scientists, put together um, a decadal report. Um, so every decade they say, this is the science that we would like to prioritize over the next decade. The, the latest one came out just over a year ago. So we and other NASA centers would like to do everything that's in that report, but it all costs money. And so um, working with NASA headquarters to understand um, how we might do um, a mission to Venus for a certain cost, we will do preliminary mission designs and put together proposals that they can look at. Um, and then they, um, for, for they, they have two ways of funding missions. One is um, directed, and so Europa Clipper, for example, was a directed mission, and there were lots of um, politics involved in, in that one. Um, probably too much to go into here, but it was, it was originally supposed to launch on an SLS, and, then, and that was written into law, but the SLS schedule slipped, and so we, we worked, NASA headquarters worked to disconnect Europa Clipper from the SLS and have us be able to launch on a Falcon Heavy, which is what the launch vehicle will be now. So that's an example of the politics that is done at NASA headquarters. We support it. We support those discussions with data and um, analyses and that sort of thing. But also, you might be referring to the competed programs. NASA runs um, both a discovery competition and a New Frontiers competition. Uh, discovery missions are a billion, a billion dollars, say, life cycle cost. New Frontiers missions are maybe two billion um, mission cost. And um, NASA, when they run these competitions, they will look at proposals from um, all NASA centers, and JPL obviously wants to bid on the ones that play to our strengths and, and provide opportunities for us to uh, launch, uh, to fly instruments that we might be developing the technologies for. And that is um, also one that we, we are not allowed to lobby, but we also want to um, put the best, foot, best face forward on our proposals to try to convince NASA that our proposal for um, the Psyche mission, for example, was a, a discovery selection that JPL won, that, that you know, our proposal for this mission to Psyche was a worthwhile scientific question to answer and could be done for the cost that we proposed and, and with the partnerships that, that we proposed. Um, over other mission proposals that other centers, and even JPL would put in more than one proposal, would, would select. So there's politics involved in that sense in terms of um, the review boards that, that look at these mission proposals and decide um, the NASA SMD administrator des or, yeah, decides which of the, the proposals that are, that are put forward get selected. So there is that sort of... Um, competition and politics as well. Does that get at what you were asking? And do we have a question? Oh, so do we have a question up here and then Michael can run back there. There we go. Oh, there we go. Hi there. Um, my question is, what are some of the hypotheses you hope to test or like big questions you hope that this, some of the data in your most recent missions um, can help answer in like the, the long term and I guess the, the near term? I would say that the big question that um, several of our missions focus on is, is there life elsewhere in the solar system or the universe? And so um, the Mars missions, for example, um, Spirit and Opportunity found evidence of water. Um, Curiosity found evidence of past conditions for habitability, and so now Perseverance and Mars Sample Return want to bring samples back to the labs on Earth that have much better capabilities than we can put on a rover to analyze. And then similarly, Europa Clipper is going to be looking at the moon Europa, which has an ice shell, icy shell and a salty ocean uh, underneath it. And on Earth, everywhere you find water, you find life, and so the the hypothesis is, is Europa currently, um, does it currently have the conditions for habitability? And so that's another example 
Um, Enceladus, a moon of Saturn, has the same type of icy shell, salty ocean, and so that's another potential site for habitability. So that's really, I think, the key question that we're trying to get at. And how much is the James Webb telescope helping, like, in the meantime? You might have a better answer to that. The, the question was, how much is the James Webb telescope helping in all this? I mean, James Webb, for, um, for us, has tried to, has taken pictures of Jupiter and Saturn, but not in a way that we can discern um, habitability, to my knowledge. Yeah, it's more focused on, like, this is from James Webb, so galaxies, <laughs> exoplanets. So we might be able to find exoplanets that, you know, seem like they're in that Earth size category uh, and maybe characterize some exoplanet atmospheres to say, oh, that one has oxygen, so that could be really favorable to life. But it probably wouldn't be a life detection mission by itself. Next question back here. Uh, hey, Jane. I'm uh, Don from, I'm uh, actually a fourth year. Uh, PhD student here in UBC. I do condensed matter, not really from this community, but I thought it was like really fun to listen. Um, my question is kind of related to the safety concern of like bringing, you know, out space. You know, it's kind of sci-fi, but you know, bringing out space, you know, rock samples or other samples to the planet Earth. Like, um, I'm just wondering, like, is there? Uh, I guess I can split it into two parts. One is like, how how can we uh, test the safety? You know other than you know, before it was brought back on Earth, I heard like you're saying like there are also mini laboratories built on the rover and stuff. And the other, the second part of the question is like when it's back on Earth, is there any safety measurement that we, you know, take to ensure that there's something that unknown, you know, uh, we can kind of contain it uh, rather than kind of destroy the, um, I'm, I'm not really, I guess there is still a chance, but you know, because the chance is low, but you know the cost is so high. So I thought, like, it's also like a question to kind of discuss, like, are there any safety measurement on that? So the um, the planetary protection aspect of both not wanting to bring any Earth microbes to another planet like Mars, um, and so there's very stringent cleaning and sterilization requirements that are done to the hardware on Earth before it launches, and then there's uh, even stricter requirements for um, back, backward planetary protection. We don't want to bring any microbes back to Earth in a way that they're not contained reliably. And there's um, a lot of effort going on right now uh, to design the sample retrieving retrieval facility which would be the facility that the samples would go into, and so they would do that in a way that is that they're 110 percent confident that nothing would get out unless it was intentionally um, sterilized and then and then brought out to go to um, another lab other than the sample retrieving facility. There are um, we had this discussion with some students at lunch today, and, and there are, I, are international requirements on planetary protection that um, the U.S. follows and JPL follows. So the planetary protection aspect is, is front and center in um, our design requirements all along. And didn't you send Cassini into a burn-up in the atmosphere around Saturn because you wanted to protect... Um, its moons from the possibility of life from Earth? Yes. One of the disposal techniques is to fly the spacecraft Cassini into Saturn. Uh, Galileo was intentionally flown into Jupiter, and the same thing will happen with Juno. Once it mission, its mission ends, Juno will be directed to fly into Jupiter to um, burn up and, and, and get crushed to prevent any contamination for the moons. Um, Question up there, Aaron? Further questions up here? There's one here. Oh, we have, okay, one here, then we'll go back here. Uh, hi there. Um, I'm a first year bachelor student here at UBC. Um, I'm like, kind of interested in like exoplanet stuff, so I was wondering, does JPL have any plans to do any stuff like uh, work on any projects outside of the solar system or like any exoplanetary stuff? <laughs> So JPL did have a project that I worked on in the um, early mission study phase called the Space Interferometry Mission, which was 
in the late 90s, and that was before Earth-based telescopes had really discovered any exoplanets uh, because they weren't at the te technologically level to, to make those discoveries. And so we worked on trying to come up with designs for um, using interfer interferometric measurements from space to do that, and it turned out to be extremely difficult and um, expensive. And in the meantime, the ground-based uh, telescopes had caught up, essentially. And so um, we don't have, we do have a mission, um, I guess it's run by Goddard, the, um, what's it called? Test? W, w, no, w, w first, I think it's been renamed. But it's an exoplanet mission that um, JPL is building a technology demonstration um, sunshade to try to um, block out the light from the star and be able to look for planets. But that is, do you remember the name? I don't know. I'm blanking on the name of the mission. No. I yeah. think it might but have been, re is that the Nancy Roman? Group? Yes, okay. thank you. You win the prize. <laughs> Nancy Roman telescope mission. So that one, I believe, is looking for ex looking at exoplanets. Okay, next question. Hello. Um, uh, hey, thank, thank you so much. I learned a lot of the speech. I'm also like a first year engineering student, at, uh, undergraduate engineering student at UBC. So I just have two questions. One of those, like, you probably like how like a lot of these rovers and like satellites, they have like they can like last for years like without like any like like touching. I was wondering like like what what are some like redundancy or, or like self correction things that are like <laughs> that are like placed because I know like th like there's like there's like self correcting technologies and like there's also like things kind of like bit flipping in like dust and also like uh, solar so uh, like solar radiation and I was wondering like what are like some things like that you you've done to like make make it so so it lasts without like repair <laughs> and then. And then, like, are there like any like satellites or like rovers that like that are like designed to like just like uh, like help help like physically repair the rover? And then my other question is like, I heard JPL like also works with like something like ion propulsion, and like that and something like interesting because they've also used in satellites. So something like like has there been any like other research that has been done on ion propulsion and like what's kind of the future of that? Like, oh boy. Um. <laughs> Okay, so in terms of um, redundancy um, for our, and, and our missions lasting for a long time, um, let's say we have um, on 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 missions that are are very expensive and and low risk. We often have two of everything, and so we'd have two sun sensors, two star trackers, um, four reaction wheels where three are needed, and so they. The software monitors the hardware and looks for um, non-normal signals coming from the sensor. And so if the sun sensor signal goes all dark or something, um, then it will try to turn off and turn back on the sun sensor to see if that will fix it. And if that doesn't fix it, it goes to the next tier of fault protection response and it'll swap to the other side. Or it might, and if that doesn't fix it, then um, there's often in, this, in these missions um, two um, processors and two buses. And so you might swap buses, you might swap processors. So there's a whole tiered sequence of activities that are more and more impactful. So we try to fix it at the lowest level. Um, so that's one way to do it. Um, we, don't, we don't have um, little arms that can repair, but we do do this sort of thing where we can turn things off and on, we can reset processors, um, we can um, upload new versions of flight software from the ground through the deep space network so that if we need to, we find bugs, and we, you know, so it's very difficult to make perfect software. And so we find bugs, we can um, fix them on the ground, upload a new version of flight software. And, if, and we can um, also, if we learn something about the hardware that then we want to build into our fault protection algorithms, we can do that in the software and then upload a new version. So there's that, that the software is the one thing we can change once the spacecraft leaves the surface of the Earth. And we do a lot of, of that. 
Um, as far as ion propulsion, uh, the Dawn mission to um, Ceres and Vesta used ion propulsion very successfully, and the Psyche mission um, that's launching next month will is also an ion propulsion um, mission. Uh, JPL did a lot of ion propulsion um, development in the um, the days that led to um, its use on Dawn, um, and then they um, it, ion propulsion is used commercially now, and so um, Maxar is the spacecraft vendor for the Psyche mission, and they were already familiar with you know ion propulsion, and so they were selected. They didn't understand autonomy, fault protection, <laughs> the types of things we were just talking about. So that's where JPL had to um, partner with them to um, mature their design and add these other features. But that's um, something that is a very useful technique. Any further questions up here? Yes. Hi. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, you talked about collaboration and competition within NASA, but my question is sort of like, um, about competition internationally. So when you're like choosing these missions, are you led by the sentiment of um, like what are they, what is already being, like should we do something that's not already being done? Or is it this idea of there, someone else is trying to do something and we're gonna do it first? And like is there a committee or is there someone sort of keeping track of what is going on in the international space community? Um, we certainly have our, um, our we, call them, we call them the formulation folks, the people who come up with the mission design ideas and work with the science community very closely to understand. And the scientists are very international. They, they meet all the time all over the world and um, hopefully work together. <laughs> I think they don't really care about borders. It's just like who's the best person to work on this specific thing. It doesn't really matter where that person is. They'll try to figure out how can we involve that person, even if it's a mission that's led by NASA. So I, yes, and so I would say that um, there is very good awareness um, as to what each other is doing. And, um, and I know that, yeah, so NASA and ESA and, and the other agencies, CSA, for example, work closely together. You also have a very international team, Jen, because I know when we were in Vienna at that conference dinner, I was seated among a bunch of your young employees, and they were from everywhere around the world. Yes, well, we are happy to <laughs> um, host and, and hire um, the best people in every field and, and uh, the trick, though, is that, unfortunately, um, we, after 9-11, the ITAR restrictions have really tightened up. And so now, uh, generally, f to work at JPL, you need to be a US citizen or a permanent resident. Although there are some fields, scientists, for example, there's, there are many um, foreign national scientists at JPL. There are many um, who work in um, navigation, um, some of the areas that are not considered ITAR, um, but it's difficult because the, their access is restricted in terms of what they can get access to in the JPL libraries and that sort of thing. Hi, uh, I'm a first year student at UBC too. Um, I'm just wondering how has AI been integrated into any of the missions, any of the JPL missions already? And with like the breakthrough in AI, like how could that benefit maybe efficiency in dealing with problems, uh, maybe on board the actual uh, thing instead of from the ground. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm just curious about that. So one of the challenges that we have with our missions is that the technology that is launched on launch day is several years old. You know, mission development timelines are quite lengthy, four years, five years, the Mars rovers at three years was a, you know, 24/7 for three solid years straight, and so, um, so the technology, both hardware and software, are not the latest. So, there, to my knowledge, none of the new AI algorithms have been incorporated into any flight software that I'm aware of. Um, I think that that that's going to be a 
challenge for us. There are pros and cons to what AI can do for you. And so um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. There is a group at JPL that just got formed to start looking at that question. Questions up front. Uh, hi, I'm Neil. I'm a first year bachelor's student at UBC. Um, I'm curious, is there any like lessons in particular you've learned like managing all these different like sub teams that are all doing uh, working towards something, but like in different aspects of it? Something that I've learned? Uh, yeah, like a lesson that you've learned, uh, like in managing Patience? <laughs> <laughs> I would say that um, over the years, I, I really, one of, the, one of the rewards that I get out of managing a team is um, seeing the team have clear, roles and responsibilities, understanding of the goal that everyone's working towards, excellent communication, um, respect for the ideas. Uh, this, um, this always, uh, what can go wrong? Uh, we call it proper paranoia. You don't, you don't want to be so paranoid that you're frozen, but you want to keep asking those questions to make sure that you're, you're developing a robust design. And so over the years, I've evolved kind of a management philosophy with three parts that work for me. And um, one is safety of people, hardware, and the environment. One is communication, which means both very open communication, active listening. Um, and also, the third one is respect. And so I feel that if you operate by those tenants and you, you model that behavior and you hold that as the <clears throat> example for how you want the team to behave, that it creates an environment where everyone can do their best. Uh, next question back here. Thank you. Um, I'm Sophia. I'm a graduate student in the neuroscience program and a journalist for the UBC. Um, first off, I want to say um, this has been such a phenomenal talk. Uh, Jan, your career is just so mind-blowing, and we've had some excellent moderation from Tanya as well. Um, a pleasure to be here. My question is on the part of mentorship. So in the audience today, we have some wonderful questions from first-year students, from PhD students, so many people on a way to a really exciting career in their own right. Jen, I'm curious, do you have any words of wisdom or potentially any career advice, any skills that these budding space enthusiasts can hope to hone as they launch themselves into a career in their own right? I think I mentioned earlier, or maybe I may, I've been doing a lot of talking to groups today, <laughs> so I may not have mentioned it here, but one thing that I value about JPL is that you're you're valued for what you bring to the table and what you accomplish. And so, um, so we're, we're very strong on um, diversity and in inclusivity and respect. I mean, that's what my respect tenant represents. So I would look for opportunities to um, own a responsibility, deliver on that, don't, um, don't flit from one half-finished job to another half-finished job, be able to, to, to show that I've, I did that and I made that contribution. And that starts to build your reputation. People know then what you're capable of and what the next um, step would be for you in terms of broadening, more responsibility, um, you know, whatever direction, more depth in the technical field you know, that you want to go. So really looking to um, own your responsibilities and deliver and um, and be ready for the next opportunity. Question here. Um, hi, I'm Shi Yu. Uh, before, this kind of connects to one of the previous questions, but before you mentioned that on a lot of your missions, you try to anticipate uncertainties in the environment. So for example, on like the Mars rover missions, what were certain features on the spacecraft that you implemented um, to try to like anticipate things in the climate? And were there actually any sort of differences between what you expected in the Mars environment and what you guys actually got that made those like features necessary? Oh, um, 
the thermal environment on the surface of Mars is pretty drastic, pretty stressful. I mean, it goes from very cold to very hot um, during the Martian day. And so making sure that um, we, we test our electronics um, beyond the temperature limits that we think that they will um, see on the surface of Mars. And then we monitor the, the mission, uh, the, ro the rover or the lander uh, in place to make sure that we understand the thermal extremes that it's seeing. And then we um, have heaters that we can turn on or turn off to make sure that we're keeping um, the, the main electronics are often enclosed in a, um, you know, a, a, a cube or an aluminum uh, structure so that um, they can help keep each other warm and, and also then we have louvers to release heat um, during the day. And so understanding that you have options to play with, um, and that the spacecraft will do autonomously. It'll turn off heaters, it'll open louvers, that sort of thing. So that may be one example of finding the environment, ex environmental extremes that you're seeing thermally might be greater than you anticipated and the spacecraft has the, the capability to respond. Jim, did you want to comment on the mole? <laughs> <laughs> did you? No. <laughs> so um, I didn't talk about um, the InSight mission. Um, it, uh, its mission has ended, but it was a lander um, with both um, a seismometer on the surface of Mars that measured Mars quakes to better understand um, the, the interior structure of the planet, and also had a mole that was supposed to um, dig down and carry sensors down to two meters or so, and it, it ran into some sort of obstruction. and. I, the way I had envisioned it, let's say this is the surface, and instead of nice, you know, soil, penetrable soil that the mole can just like hammer its way down, it like ran into a rock or some, some hard, that it couldn't hammer through. And, and also there were, um, in the ground testing that was trying to debug this, they, they found that maybe the mole, um, the mole, hammering mechanism wasn't as robust as it thought. It might have just been slipping inside the hammering structure. Um, so it tried, they tried to hammer it around, and, you know, to try to get down, and they, they um, tried everything they could, but nothing worked, and so the mole never succeeded. But the Germans built that, right? That wasn't JPL. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Lesson learned. <laughs> That's true. It was a free contribution. <laughs> okay, next question here. Hi, um, I'm hoping that you can speak to whatever work the JPL might be doing in regards to virtual and augmented reality and perhaps uh, interfacing with the next gener generation of drones and, and rovers on Mars, if there is any work being done. So we do use, I guess you would call it augmented reality with the goggles, and um, we use that a lot to... Um, People will be standing around a space, and they'll all be wearing the goggles and seeing the spacecraft structure, say. And they'll use that to look for, um, can, I, can I install this heater this way? Do I have the accessibility? Do I, have, um, do I need to design this differently in order to um, put the pieces together of the design, because you can, you can design something from an engineering standpoint that is impossible to assemble, or once it's assembled, you can't debug it if there's a problem inside. And so we've, we've used augmented reality to, to do that sort of thing from at the design stage. And then also in our um, assembly and test um, facility, when we're putting the whole spacecraft together, they'll use it to um, test run their procedures. You know, they'll. Everything that we do on the spacecraft follows a procedure that is diligently developed and reviewed multiple times to make sure it's correct. And they'll, one of the ways they'll do that is they'll run the procedure in the augmented reality space rather than doing it for the first time on the real hardware. Because he envisions an Iron Man working on <laughs> <laughs> well, there's designs. Question here. 
Hi, thanks so much for coming to this moderated discussion. Uh, my question was, I'm sure at your time at JPL, you've seen many proposed missions come across your desk that didn't come into fruition. What's one that maybe you wish you, uh, that had come into being that you would have liked to see? Hmm. I would say that um, the Europa Lander study was really making some good headway on, for a lander to survive on Europa, it, it could only last maybe 30 days or 60 days because of the um, environment, the radiation environment is so extreme there. And so they were making great strides in autonomy and um, onboard decision making and um, how to how to run how to do, make the scientific measurements that they wanted autonomously quick you know driven by the short mission duration and so I think that there were some great um, technological advances that the team was making that um, another example is uh, the surface of Europa is if you can imagine really incredibly huge jagged ice cliffs and, and, and spires, and so how do you land on that type of surface? So they were doing a lot of landing leg uh, investigations, and so I've been at a test bed that would drop a landing leg and, and see how, um, you know, what kind of surface could it land on and how, how could it be un, unbalanced, you know, not, not landing on a nice flat surface, but a very unbalanced surface. And so there were some really great technological advances that were being made, and unfortunately, the support for Europa Lander was not in the latest decadal, planetary uh, decadal that came out last year. The, the scientists were more focused on Enceladus around Saturn because the radiation environment is much less severe. Okay, back of the room, we have another very accomplished female space engineer here. Uh, Ellen Kinney, who is the Director of Technology Strategy for MDA. Uh, Ellen is a fellow of the Outer Space Institute, and MDA is actually the sponsor of this lecture series. So thank you, Ellen, and thank you to your company, and I know you have a question. Uh, Jan uh, and Tanya, thank you for being here today. It's, I really enjoyed uh, the uh, conversation. Um, a question for Jan. So we've seen um, the emergence of small sats within our industry and a pro proliferation of um, small sats being deployed in low Earth orbit. Uh, could you tell us about any novel planetary science exploration missions that could successfully use small, small sat technology? Uh, the Lunar Trailblazer uh, that I mentioned earlier is um, a small sat, and so um, that's based on um, a Lockheed, it's a Lockheed Martin small sat bus that um, they're developing, and, and then we provided a couple of instruments to fly, so it's a less expensive, higher risk tolerance, um, smaller two instrument package um, that is leveraging a small sat bus. So I think that there is definitely um, a role that small sets can play, but I will tell you a downside, which is every project needs a project manager, a systems engineer, a flight system manager, a mission system manager, a project system, I said project systems engineer, a mission assurance manager, a business manager. I mean, you, you need to fill all of those roles. And, and um, at first, people thought that, um, especially working with CubeSats, that you could have a CubeSat team um, put together by a bunch of less experienced people, and then um, it was quickly learned that, contrary to that approach, you really need more experienced people because you have a smaller team, so people need to be more multidisciplinary. And also, when you're, when you're doing a small, a CubeSat or a small SAT, it's typically a, a higher risk tolerance. And you need engineers who've had the experience who know where to cut the corners. On a mission like Europa Clipper, 
you do every test, you, you do every analysis, you, and if you don't want, you don't, you have to write paperwork and get an approved waiver to not do something. But on a small SAT or a CubeSat, you want to do it in a less expensive manner, so your team is smaller, you, you have to do less, but you still want it to succeed. So how, you need the experience, so it's, it's the flip of what we originally thought, and we found that the small SAT missions get into trouble a lot more frequently than the bigger missions, and so it takes a lot of overhead um, of experienced people where we would perhaps like to use them on the higher, I don't want to say, the, the lower risk tolerance missions. So can, may I ask a follow-up then? Uh, I guess what you're implying is small SAT missions don't work very well if you're doing onesies, twosies. You really need to deploy at scale to, to uh, realize those economies of scale. Yes, if you had a product line, and, and um, there are companies who are developing good CubeSat and SmallSat product lines that are becoming um, more reliable, and, um, and that's a good thing. But it still takes the overhead of the experienced people at JPL to make sure that the team is staying on track. I think part of the cost of scale thing with CubeSats too on Earth is the fact that they're easy to launch. You just put them in orbit, right? And you don't have that when you're at the moon or Mars or Jupiter. So it start, we worked on a 10 satellite constellation concept with TeamX back mm. uh, a couple of years ago as part of the decadal survey to study the Martian atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was 10 satellites from CubeSat to small-ish, mid-size sat size but the cost came out to $5 billion. And so it's like, well, for that price, we could send a flagship mission. So is there really any benefit at the end of the day, at least with this type of technology JPL could look at right now, to using small SATs to accomplish that, rather than just building you know, one big satellite like we're used to for these missions? Hmm. Interesting. So we need to be somewhat mindful of time. Uh, so we only have a few more questions left. So if you're really burning, I want to really encourage you to get those questions in. <laughs> OK, there we go. We had a bunch of hands shut out. Come over there. <laughs> so to put on the pressure. Hi, I'm Charlotte. I'm a junior fellow at the Outer Space Institute and a political science master's student here at UBC. Um, I wanted to ask, given that we've seen a proliferation of space objects and space debris in low Earth orbit, at your time at JPL over the years, how has mission design or mission operation um, had to accommodate for that changing space environment? Um, well, certainly our missions that go through that belt <laughs> to the planets just have to miss them, um, so to speak. Um, I think it's more a problem for astronomers who are taking observations of um, asteroids or um, planets that they get the interference that they have to deal with um, in terms of, we were talking earlier today about removing the streaks from um, these Starlink satellites or, or uh, similar constellations. Um, I don't know of anything at JPL that has worried about that explicitly. But I will ask my son, because he works at JPL, and he does mission design. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll put that on the list. And we're seeing a very rapid change even, even now. So yeah. that, it's a, we're in a very different part of the growth of satellites. Oh, hi. Thank you for an interesting conversation. Um, I was going to ask, following up on all these uh, space satellites, because every time Elon Musk uh, launches another, you know, hundred thousand or whatever um, satellites, and then you keep reading about all these instances where the International Space Station had to steer away from all kinds of, you know, old debris and junk floating up there. Are we going to reach a point where we got to start clearing all that out so you can launch more things? I hope so. <laughs> I think um, there's, I, I'm not personally aware but I, myself, but I believe that there are certainly efforts looking at how to scoop up orbital debris or um, do something to put requirements on, on spacecraft to make sure that they come back and burn up in the atmosphere after a certain length of time, that sort of thing. It's so definitely it's needed. Irresponsible polluting space as we are polluting Earth, yeah. yeah. 
just a, a brief advertisement for the Outer Space Institute. Uh, we, we actually have projects on mega constellations of satellites and, and space debris and light pollution affecting astronomy. Sometimes Aaron and I think that our research agenda is driven by what Elon Musk does when he gets up in the morning. <laughs> um, but if you go to the Outer Space Institute, you'll see all kinds of cool work. And it's not just Aaron and me, but it's our global network of, of experts working on these issues. OK, we had some, a bunch of hands that shot up here. Hi, um, I'm an, also an undergrad student here uh, in my first year. Um, what was your most rewarding experience working with the JBL? JPL? JPL? Yeah. Jet Propulsion Laboratory? Yeah. My most rewarding experience? Mm -hmm. In 43 years? Hmm. <laughs> I would say, well, certainly the missions that I've worked on that actually, um, you know, Galileo, Cassini, MER, Juno, Getting the science data back, you know, is really the the gratification for the the years of, of hard work. Um, but I think also what I personally like to accomplish and that gives me self satisfaction is leading a team, leading a team that I think I said earlier, you know, everyone has. They understand what their roles are. They understand how they interact with others. They understand communication. They they um, they 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 commit to their agreements, deadlines, and they they hold to them. Or if they can't, they let the person know immediately. They they ask questions when needed. They don't you know stew in a corner. So when you see a well-oiled team operating that way, and I, I can give you um, an example. When I was running the attitude control subsystem on Cassini, it was July, I think, and the spacecraft was launching in October. And um, that's the time, so the spacecraft was down at the Cape, everything was all done, uh, and that's the time when you, you worry every day about what we call guide-up alerts, where um, someone will find a problem with a part type, and then you have to look through all your electronics, do you have that part type? So that happened, and, and there was a part in one of our, um, on one of our electronics boards that was actually bad, uh, that we didn't know, would, wouldn't, wouldn't meet the reliability requirements. So we had to change it out. So, oh my gosh, what do you do? So my team jumped into action. I mean, they, they, um, they started, you know, some people started writing the procedures for how they would open up the spacecraft, take out that electronics box, take out that electronics slice, um, someone else um, set up the, hard, the hardware um, engineering model back at the lab to do the same repair. Someone else went and got the best technician, had him, you know, helped him, worked with him to write the procedure, um, had him practice on the engineering model part. Um, someone else wrote the, the scripts to, to run, to run the, the tests, the, the, the software hardware in the loop test bed after that part had been replaced to make sure that it was done correctly. Um, someone else planned his travel to get, you know, that guy to get him down to the Cape. They had um, pulled this, the spacecraft, the box out of the spacecraft. They pulled the cart out, got him onto the floor. He made the change. They put it together. They put it back in. They retested. I mean, everyone knew what their part was to make this happen in a week, you know, because it was super time critical. The spacecraft had to keep moving through the preparation for launch, and yet we had to replace that part. And so to me, the, the years of working with a team and, and having modeled that, um, that expectation that, that people knew what they were supposed to be doing, they knew how to interact with their, the, their partners, they knew their work well enough that they could um, immediately dive in and, and with very little guidance, you know, go off and do the right thing. To me, that was my proudest moment, is, is that that team was at that point when a crisis hit, they were able to respond. So I think we can take one more question, and we said we're doing it up here, all right, in the back. 
Hi, Jan. Richard, we met earlier today. I just wanted to follow up on that. Can you talk a little bit about how you build a team that has that sense of mission and personal responsibility and, and coordination? Like, how do you as a leader do that? Well, part of it, I think, is um, through um, role modeling, you know, mo role modeling that expectation. Uh, some of it is through um, talking explicitly about that expectation. Um, some of it is, uh, you know, we, we have a million, my, my, my day w w was a million meetings, basically, because you're constantly checking in with everybody to make sure that um, you're, you're asking the right questions to draw out any issues of misunderstanding or a, a disconnect. And so, um, you know, ha ha meetings large and small, the, the proper paranoia, you know, seeing that modeling in action, uh, and also just the, again, back to the not being a profit-making organization and having that desire to achieve the science is really what's driving people. And so um, having, having um, happy hours after work, you know, having team building activities, um, things that build that camaraderie and trust that then when you're in this difficult situation, you know you can count on the person. Things like that. So for the sake of time, we're going to go ahead and end the uh, discussion here. I, I have to say, that just listening to this conversation, you know, things that are jumping out is that we're hearing how space exploration is a science endeavor. It's an endeavor of exploration and discovery. It's an endeavor of understanding ourselves and a place in the solar system. Uh, and it's also then a very human uh, type of uh, ex uh, event, whether we are sending people in that exploration or whether it's robots. There's a human element that's deeply integrated into it. And I really want to thank you both for being here and sharing these experiences with us. So let's thank Tanya and Jan one more time. I also want to give a special thank you to Andrew Fall, who's the research coordinator at the <laughs> Outer Space Institute and really helped to put things together. He's hiding in the back there, <laughs> so ever you could give a wave to him and, and say thank you to Andrew. <laughs> and we wouldn't be able to hear each other and have a record of the event without Dave, who's running the sound and the video. So thank you very much, Dave. If you would like to know more about activities at the Outer Space Institute, please go to outerspaceinstitute.ca, and you can find out quite a bit more about the various activities that are done at UBC and also internationally. Uh, please look up at some of the amazing things that MDA is doing, particularly uh, with the uh, Gateway and the exploration of uh, the moon. Uh, and once again, thank all of you for attending and being part of this conversation. Thank you.